Look up. The path that lays ahead is harsh, but you have not been left to wander it alone. The Lord your God will be by your side every step of the way. He'll lead you by the hand, keeping watch of your path. Look up. Remember what he's already delivered you from. His faithfulness is a pattern. He's promised to never leave you or forsake you, and these promises never return void. Though the land be dry, he will use this place to spring up new life within you. He is your fire by night and shade in the heat of day. Look up. He's providing a way for you. So, is anyone in here, you ever taken a trip that it took a whole lot longer than you thought it would? Anyone here that you, were, or that you wanted it to? Go ahead, lift your hand up. Let me see. You've taken a trip that took you a whole lot longer than you wanted to. Amen. Good. I'm not alone. Well, years ago, before Jenny and I had kids and we were uh, newly married, uh, Jenny's uh, grandfather, Hun, was in the hospital in Columbia. So we drove up there. It took us an hour and a half uh, to uh, get up there, visited, had prayer with him. Then we get in the car. Late, it's pretty late. We get in the car, and I check the oil, and uh, I add a quart of oil to my, my, my car, and I forget to put the cap on the oil back on. That was where we put the oil in the car, in the engine. I forgot to put the cap on. Close the hood. We're driving back to Somerville, to Charleston, and have no idea that during, while we're driving, uh, oil up under the hood is just going everywhere. Eventually, we find out because the uh, thermostat gauge starts going to hot. And so uh, we, pop, we pull off to the side of the road, and, and we pop the hood, and, and the oil, it caused it to get so hot that the radiator hose uh, popped and it got a hole in the radiator hose, the hose. And so it's late at night and we're trying to figure out where to, uh, a parts store and they're all closed. So we get this creative idea, like we got to work tomorrow. Uh, wh what are we going to do? And, and so we got duct tape and some gallon jugs of water. And uh, for uh, multiple times, we would duct tape the hole that was in the radiator hose and, uh, and then fill the the car back up with water, and we eventually made it back home at 3 in the morning. A trip that should have taken only an hour and a half ended up being about quadruple that amount of time it took to get home. And it's just, uh, as looking at the raise of hands that I know I'm not alone, that many of you have taken a trip uh, that you wanted to be shorter than uh, you actually thought it would be and it ended up being a whole lot longer, and it was very frustrating. Well, when we're looking at our walk with God, and God is, has called each one of us uh, to have our relationship with Jesus where our character becomes more and more like Christ, we don't want to take the long trip. We want to take the short trip where we learn the lessons and we don't end up uh, uh, having to learn it again and again and again. Because what, what happens, God teaches you in lessons it, when to learn it tends to have some pain a lot of times with those lessons as we've been, uh, as we're walking in disobedience, so we learn our lesson. So, so how do we not take the long trip, but the short trip in becoming more and more like Christ? I'm glad you asked. Thank God as we're in this journey, uh, Red Thread in the Wilderness, that God speaks directly to this. That what we can do is learn from mistakes other people have made in Scripture. So they're like, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do what God told them, what they were supposed to obey. I'm going to follow the first time or at least maybe the second time. Well, the children of Israel, when they are in the wilderness on this trip, that, that God had promised them to bring them into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, 
blessings of God. God's done the miracles. And, and this trip should have only taken by foot two weeks. And it ends up taking the children of Israel 40 years. Ouch. I don't know about you, but I don't want to take the 40-year trip. I would rather take the two-week trip. Who, who's with me? You with me? Yeah. So we're going to dig into God's Word today and look at the children of Israel and, and learn from them. Now, remember, as we're, we're, now, we're now in the book of uh, Numbers, and we're in the first, and we're going through all of the books of the Bible. We started in the, the Torah is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the, the really, between Exodus and Deuteronomy, the last four books of the Torah, the law, that G, Moses is the central figure in these books. And so now that we're in Numbers, which is the fourth book of the Bible, uh, Right out of the gate in Numbers chapter 1, Numbers 1, you can follow along uh, on the screen or uh, in your message notes. Numbers chapter 1, verse 2, it, God uh, tells Moses, tell the people, take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel, by clans, by fathers, houses, according to the number of names, every male, head by head. So this is how the book of Numbers gets its name is right from the beginning, it takes a census. But the Hebrew tradition would use the word, would use the title in the wilderness for this book because they were in the wilderness and it described uh, their journey. And, and so as we dig into scripture, uh, thus we, you know, we call in the series Red Thread in the Wilderness. Um, so let, let's look at the journey of the book of Numbers. And I want to show you a picture of their journey here. Uh, so they... They are in uh, at Mount Sinai, and then what they from Mount Sinai they take a journey. Matter of fact, I'll give you the uh, outline. We want to go ahead and throw up the outline for for us in in Numbers chapter one, verse one through ten. Uh, they what what happens here is they are at Mount Sinai. It took about two months from the journey out of Egypt, the Exodus to get to Mount Sinai, and we pick it up in Exodus 19, where they are at Mount Sinai. Now, in the middle of Numbers 10, they will leave Mount Sinai and, and journey, and at this point, the, the, uh, Numbers 10 through 12 covers that journey, and they'll end up at the wilderness of Kadesh, which is Numbers 13 through 19. This is where they disobey the Lord again and don't believe him and, uh, and don't obey him, so they there's the consequence of the 40 year where the next generation, God's waiting until the next generation uh, is raised up and then they would go and receive the promised land. And then they travel again, uh, Numbers 20 and 21, and then they, and they end up in the wilderness of Moab from Numbers 22 through 36 during this journey and where they're at the brink of going into the promised land. So that's just a quick little, very short, condensed outline of numbers but let's look at numbers chapter 1 uh, verse 53 numbers chapter 1 verse 53 uh, and the Lord tells uh, Moses here but the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel and the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. So the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, is in the center where God's presence dwelled in the Holy of Holies. And so that's in the center. And then the Levites are commanded to uh, guard the tabernacle around it. So that's where they were. And then we pick it up in uh, Numbers 2, uh, the second part of verse 2, uh, that uh, all the other tribes of, uh, of the Israelites of uh, would, uh, they, would, they shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. So the big thing here, God's, the tabernacle's in the center, then the Levites, then all the other tribes are surrounding, and they camp facing the tabernacle. Now let's jump all the way to Numbers chapter 10, when they travel and they leave Mount Sinai, and their, their trip to Kadesh, in Numbers chapter 10, 34 and 35. 
so that they, and this is them setting out, so that they set out from the mount of the Lord three days journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them three days journey to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day whenever they set out from the camp. Now, one little commentary on this before we break this down. Uh, commentary here on Leviticus, uh, I meant Numbers 19, uh, Numbers 10, verse 33 and 34. These verses describe the first three-day march from Mount Sinai towards Kadesh, led by the cloud and the ark. The repetition of three days emphasizes the short distance traveled. It does not imply the ark was separated from the main party by this distance. As the ark set out and rested, Moses expressed his confidence that God would bring Israel successfully into Canaan. Now, so, what we have here. is here's the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, with, and this is the ark, symbol of the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God right here. And God has them place the, the tabernacle in the center where here the Levites are surrounding it, guarding it, and then uh, all the tribes of Israel, which is really cool. As a matter of fact, I cut and paste breaking down a lot of this. I said, we're going to save that till tomorrow when I do the takeaway podcast. So we're not, tomorrow you want to check that out. It's going to be cool, but we're, we're not going to break that down because it would take too long. But it, what you have here is the, 12, the, the tribes of Israel camped around the tabernacle. And what, and what are they? They are camped facing the tabernacle. What's the big takeaway that God is helping the children of Israel understand? That he is to be at the center. That God is to be at the center of everything. Now, let's look at the other one here. When, um, so in uh, Numbers chapter 10, in Numbers chapter 10, we pick up where they, halfway through, where they head out to Kadesh, and Scripture shared that I read to you that the cloud, presence of God, leads the way. And when the cloud would move, they would follow. And then the, the, at the same time, the Ark of the Covenant would be in the front. And they, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, the cloud, the presence of God, would lead the way. And the people would follow. So here, God is to be at the center. Here... They are to follow, and follow what? God's leadership. Now, I don't know about you, but when I talked about learning the lesson, not having to learn it again and again, one of the things I would struggle with in my walk with God, I'm sure no one else, just me, but I would want to be in the lead. God, I know best. And so... Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. I would have to learn the lesson again and again. Children of Israel, man, as you read the book of Numbers, a lot of times they would grumble, complain. They, they, took, they, they, were, they struggled with lesson learners. So what we learn from this, let's learn from their disobedience and suffering the consequences so that we don't have to keep taking this longer journey, but that we get it the first or second time. And so we don't have wasted time in our walk with God, that we're able to make a bigger difference. So God, how, how do you know? How do you know if God's at the center of your life that God is leading? How do you know that Christ is at the center, that he is leading? That's our big first takeaway we're going to look at. Because God's holy presence is the children of Israel's leader and guide through the wilderness. And God, the same way, God wants to lead and guide us where he's at the center. So the first lesson we need to learn in our journey with God is making sure that Christ takes the center, the lead, and we don't drift away from it. Amen? Because it is, this isn't something you pray about. It's God's will to be at the center of your life. It's God's will to be at the lead. Matter of fact, Ephesians 4, verse 4 shares this. There is one body and one spirit 
just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Who is, listen to this closely, I miss this a lot when I read scripture. He is over all, not Joy Rumble, and through all in all, that God is in charge of my life. God is in charge of my family, not me. So how can we make sure that Christ is at the center? Several, a few weeks back, I was preaching on a Sunday where my foot was killing me. I had stepped on a, 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 a rusty stake, uh, uh, man, just kind of like a, a big long nail. And it went, through, it went into my foot and it hurt like crazy. Well, when I came home from church that Sunday afternoon, my foot, it, it has uh, been uh, a little bit swollen up. But, I mean, it really swole up. I mean, it was like uh, scary swelling up. And I mean, just really scary. So I was like, whoa, I need some help. I, I better get some help. And so I got some antibiotics quick and, and, and got it taken care of. Well, because of that, I wasn't able to uh, jog for a couple of weeks, which I love to jog. But just this past week, I finally got to jog again, and it was my second jog. And I'm out jogging, just like, yes, I get to run again. This is great. And all of a sudden, I see a screw in the middle of the road. I'm like, whoa. So I, I'm thinking in my head, you know, someone else can pick up that screw. So, I, you know, I'm going to keep jogging. And all of a sudden, I say, wait a second. One of my neighbors might run over and end up getting a flat tire, picking up the screw. So I, I need to stop and get it. So I, I picked up the screw. Here, here is that same screw that I picked up. And so I, I end up jogging home. And, you know, as I reflect on that, someone else might have picked up this screw. Matter of fact, I think maybe it was even likely that someone else would pick up that screw. Well, when we're talking about Christ being at the center of our lives and taking the lead, this is what's so important. Nobody else can pick up the screw for you. You got to make a choice that God is at the center of your life, that he is the one going to lead, not only your life, but your family. You, no one else can lead, lead your family. You got to make a choice that God's going to be at the center. He's going to be at the lead. And so I think that's a huge step in making sure God stays in the center and the lead is realizing no one else can pick up the screw for me. I need to do it. So let's look at some practical ways that we can pick up the screw in our, and, and, and really make sure that Christ is in the center of the lead. Now, I, I'm going to rapid fire a bunch. I in no way am a, expecting you to apply all of them. You can rewatch the message and break it down. But uh, what, I, what I'd like you to do is make sure you get, take one or two with you today of making sure Christ is at the center. Uh, the first one is being in God's word. That you, that you make sure that you saturate yourself with spending time in God's Word. Uh, if you would, flip your message notes over to the back. And I've given you a, a soap journal, just another example from the book of Numbers. When I was in the book of Numbers, this, this is a, a sample from that I, I soap journaled March 5th, 2022. And it shares, the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. My observation to guard the tabernacle and all the articles. My application, Lord, help me to guard my heart. Uh, help me to guard my family. Help me to guard your church. That there, as the Levites were guarding the tabernacle, I realized I'm called to guard the tabernacle. So what, what I like about soap journaling is you're not just taking in God's word, but you're reflecting on how to apply it into your life. So I want to encourage you, make sure that for Christ to be at the center, he needs to be at the center of your, your quality time with him. Um, another thing is understanding prayer. That prayer is communion with God and confrontation with the enemy. Every Thursday at 8 a.m. we have a, a prayer service for the entire church. If you ever want to come be a part of that, we have time where we pray together together. Pray for the church, intercede. This service, we'll be praying over all these chairs. Almost every Thursday without fail, we'll pray over all these chairs. And we'll just cover it in prayer. Then we'll break down and pray for one another and, and, and uh, share God's word. It's just a powerful time. So if it fits your schedule, also we do 21 days of prayer in August. 
would love to have you be a part of that as we launch in August. These are just ways to cultivate your prayer life. Uh, another is worship. The, the making sure that when and the worship I'm talking about, worship is who you value most. But a part of growing and valuing God is singing unto him. And so as we uh, sing unto the Lord and praise and worship, it cultivates a heart of intimacy before the Lord. I mean, I had a, a visitor show up this Sunday, uh, a, a, a mom who came with her daughter. And she says, you know, I sense the presence of God. I could just feel it on my, my just like goosebumps on my arms. And I looked at her. I said, ma'am, I don't know if I could ever receive a better compliment. Because I don't want people to come into this service and to see something other than the presence of God. We, we, the, what the church has to offer is God. And I don't want people encountering anything else but the presence of God. And, and the way that we cultivate that is by us coming together and worshiping the Lord like that and having our hearts dedicated in worshiping him. Another one is uh, two T's. I call time and treasure. How do you spend your time and how do you spend your money? What do you invest in your time and your money? And it'll tell you who, who you're, who's in the center. Your conversations, your attitude. Uh, have you stepped up in the next steps and, and serving God with your gift set? And, and let me hit another one. Uh, and and th this is really uh, another practical one of seeing if God's in the center. Hating sin, longing for holiness. And, and a mixture of that is understanding uh, to, to have this healthy grasp that we've been looking at as a church of the fear of God and the love of God. And, and this not just for your own lives, but your, for your family as well. I had a mentor years ago whose kids were older than mine. He was a little bit uh, older than me, and he's a little bit farther down the road than me. And he said he would always tell his kids, uh, and, and they both went to secular universities, he says, listen, when you go there, you got to understand the foundation that we've built to help build for you to stand on Christ, that the first day you're there, uh, the uh, professors at that foundation are just trying to chip away at it. They're trying to chip away at your foundation. And that's what Satan's doing, not only in the secular universities as you go and uh, they're, they're trying to rip you off in your faith, but man, the devil, anywhere, any age, any time with your family, it don't matter if, if your daughter or son is 39 years old or two. The devil is the seeking, stealing, kill and destroy to, to take you away from laying that foundation, distract your time, distract your attention. And so what do we do? This motivates, okay, Christ, you got to be, at, you're at the center, and I'm going to make sure that we continue to lay a foundation. I, I, I just want to encourage it. We as a church, we're all in to help you with your kids, your teenagers, to lay that strong foundation. To, to, uh, as the devil attacks, we, we want to help as you make that choice to pick up the screw personally for your life and your family, uh, that to do what God's called you to do, we're right here with you. We want to be uh, to assist you in raising up the next generation. And, and so let's do it together. And we're committed to that as leaders in our church. And, and many of you, man, you're serving, helping shape the next generation. Another great example of that is this Tuesday through Thursday. You're taking time to invest in the next generation. 30 leaders saying, hey, I'm going to pour in and help lay a foundation for the next generation. So let, let, let's talk about the hating of sin. Holiness, fear of God, love of God. The journey of becoming more and more like Jesus, uh, where you, there is this fear of God and love of God, where you understand God loves you and you love him in return, and you live with awe of God, that he's in charge, that he's the leader. And it's, to walk in holiness, you need both. It's, like, it's a double helix that you need the, the love of God and the fear of God. If we're going to have Christ at the center, it, there needs to be this healthy uh, fear of God, love of God. I, I love what uh, C.S. Lewis talks about holiness uh, because we got we to gotta really value uh, holiness 
we got to uh, make sure that we hate sin in our personal lives, in our families. C.S. Lewis said, how little people know who think holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. When we encounter God's holiness, it's a drawing to him. It's a drawing to God. Oh, cleanse my lips, God. I'm a sinful person. I, John Bevere in his book, All of God, shared two questions I think are really powerful that I want to ask you today, and I'm asking myself as well. Is the call to live a holy life so muted that all conviction has been silenced? That's a huge question to ask yourself. Second one, have I ignored this truth and his command to live holy because I have confused positional holiness with behavioral holiness? When we come to faith in Christ, Scripture says that we are justified before God. God has declared us forgiven. God has declared us righteous. He's declared us holy. The position, we, are, we have positional holiness. But Scripture goes on to say that we're to walk out holiness with fear and trembling. We're, we're to discipline the body so that we don't give into the sin, your old way. I'll read it to you in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you be holy, for I am holy. God is, we got to come back to valuing being set apart for God, valuing holiness. I, I, I love how Romans 6 puts it, that do I sin even more so grace may abound even more? And, and scripture says, don't be stupid, Apostle Paul, don't be stupid. You've died to sin. Why live in it anymore? That's, a, that's what? That's a desire, a strong pursuit of holiness. Is it a fight? Absolutely. Because the devil is fighting. And so, but I'm telling you, God is able, God is able to strengthen you. And that hope that you begin to have in the Lord, it is not disappointed. It's not. Uh, years ago, uh, not quite as many years ago as when I took the long trip back to, uh, from Columbia to Charleston, that took quadruple the time. This is when we had kids, but they were young. We were up vacationing, and you got to understand, my wife loves to pick apples, blueberries, peaches, um, strawberries. I mean, uh, and, and I, I finally got used to it where I enjoy it too now. Well, we happened to be in the mountains, and we saw a sign that said Suttles Nut Farm. And my wife is saying, oh, we can go pick, get a bunch of nuts from a, a nut farm where, you know, the trees and pecans or walnuts or whatever. And we were all excited. And we were following the sign, sold us nut farm. Here we go. It's going to be fun. Great experience for the kids. Oh, it's going to be so fun. We come around the corner. And you know what Suttles Nut Farm is? It's the back of a truck. They are selling nuts out of the back of a truck. You talk about being disappointed. We had hope up, and it was, man, it was doused. Well, I want you to know something. God says that your hope is not disappointed. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who he has given us. I'm not preaching a Suttles Nut Farm hope. I'm preaching a hope where we follow Jesus Christ and he pours out his Holy Spirit into your lives and he confirms what he promises you. He will deliver. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to unmute what's stuffing everything up and let's begin to live with conviction to resist sin and hate it in our lives. Let's continue on in Numbers chapter 10, verse 33, 34. We talked about how they're on that journey. Now, let, we need to embrace the journey. So Christ is at the center, and, and so I'm going to give you another tool that I believe will help us not have to learn the lessons over again and again. I've been using this tool for years and years and years, and I, I call it the, the journey of reflection, and we're going to throw it up on the screen. It's not, 
in your message notes. You can take a picture of it. But twice a year, usually my birthday and right before the new year, late December, I'll, I'll, I'll go right through these six questions. Sometimes I'll add something. I'll tweak it. Uh, tweak it, adjust as it fits you. But what I do, uh, here, why do I do this? And I've been doing this for years. I'm convinced that I, I'm called by God to live life intentionally with what God's called me to do. So what I do, I, I list my current age and my family's current age, and then I'll get, I add five years to it or 10 or 15 or 20. And what that does, that motivates me. Uh, so when I see my age down the road and my family's age down the road, whatever that number is, it moves me to action because I'm like, whoa, time's ticking away. So I got to be really careful with that. And so I, um, I, I, I'll do that, and that gives me motivation. Then number two, I'll write out my biggest priorities. Matter of fact, I'll read you seven, eight of them, just, but each one, you got to decide what God's called you and your priorities. One, walk with God. Two, resisting sin. Three, my health. Uh, four, my relationship with my wife, Jenny. Uh, my kids, grandkids, extended family, personal finances, Summerbrook Church, friends, those are some of my main priorities. And, and so what I do, I'll just rate how I'm doing in them. One to ten, one being horrible, lower than warm dirt. A ten being, man, I'm knocking it out of the park. I am like as close to Jesus as you get in this area. You know, that kind of thing. And so I'll rate it uh, and, and look at it, and I'll just gauge it, not from a condemning way, but what? To live life intentionally. And then what I'll do, I'll, I'll write out the answer to question, top decisions I made this past year what I'm fired up about, and regrets if this does not happen. What, what I'm after these, le- what lessons am I learning, decisions that have been good that I can repeat, or the principle of it to repeat in another area. And what I'm fired up about is usually what I'm going to get after. And so if what I'm fired up about matches what God wants for me to do, Oh, that's a beautiful spot. And so that's what you're after. You're after continuing not to uh, uh, conform to the world, but be open to what God's calling you to do. And regrets if this does not happen. What I do, I look at past regrets, but then I, I write out, at the end of this cycle of time, what would I regret most? Boy, I drive priorities right there. What would I regret most? And it always, if you're making your own priorities and are not based upon Scripture and what God uh, wants you to do, it's a waste of time. You're leading, not God. So make sure that, you know, God's in the lead, God's in the center. So I, I love that tool. I've been doing it for years. Um, let's look at red thread. Uh, scripture shares, uh, Christians have, have seen the promises in Torah as finding their ultimate fulfillment in Christ Jesus. And the cool part is that Scripture also uh, many heroes of the Old Testament have been seen as types of Christ, that their character, their attributes reflect Christ, the red thread. Preeminently, Jesus is seen as the new and greater Moses. Many times when you read the New Testament, you'll see the Sadducees and Pharisees say, hey, we follow Moses. We don't know about you. And so I love what Hebrews shares in Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. You can go ahead and put it up on the screen. It shares that Jesus is the greater Moses. That Moses was human, but Christ was God in the flesh that came to uh, set us free from our sins, that our hope is in him. But what's cool when you look at uh, the life of Moses, two red threads in the life of Moses, uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 19. Listen to this prayer uh, Moses prays. Please pardon the iniquity of this people. According to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you've forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Moses is interceding for the people. And Hebrews 7.25 shares that Christ makes intercession for us. Red thread. Another red thread. Uh, This is a powerful red thread. This is something else. Uh, In Exodus 32, verse 30 through 32, what's going on here is... uh, Moses tells God, hey, you blot me out of my book, out of your book. Please save these people. I mean, what's Moses saying? He's He's saying, I'm willing to sacrifice my life for the people. Red thread, Christ, obviously, throughout Scripture, New Testament, you see that he came to sacrifice for our sins. So two red thread responses is, who are you interceding for? 
Who are you taking time in your personal life to really intercede for and, and pray for them? And, and, and also, who are you sacrificing for? Who are you uh, uh, giving up your own rights and ministering to, to sacrifice your wants, your desires, to care for others? If you want to make headway, you need a, I encourage you. Could you imagine if we as a people chose to pick up the screw of Christ's leadership in our life and in our family. Every one of us, could you imagine what God could do in our lives, our families, our city? Could you imagine what God could do if we as a people began to say, no, 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 God, you're gonna be at the center for now on. Help me not to drift, but to stay focused on you. If you wanna make headway, you need that takeaway. So what is it, those couple of things you know God has spoken to you to apply in your life. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We so thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. I pray right now by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would surrender leadership of our lives and say, God, you lead, we'll follow. Lord, we submit to you and, Lord, those areas we need to really look at, I pray that you would show us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said together, amen.